All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at Cotting School. We're at the Campus Center in Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh, my name is Tim Richmond. I'm the director of Cotting Consulting. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we're gonna have a wonderful spirited conversation all about ABA and uh, how that applies to the classroom here at Cotting School. Uh, first, I'd just like to say thank you for joining us and uh, uh, welcoming you to uh, Cotting's day program, serving students uh, ages three to 22 uh, with cognitive, uh, physical, and communication challenges here in our specialized programming. We have a continuum of services and we just wanted to to kind of bring you in a little bit as far as the whole scope of what we can offer at Cotting School. And uh, we also have our uh, Hope House here on the campus at Cotting School in Lexington. And that's for students ages 17 to 22. Uh, it's a five day a week semi-residential program, uh, also serving students with uh, a variety of, of specialized needs. We also have Cotting Consulting, which I'm happy to uh, to talk about a little bit, and and that's where we go out and provide outreach services, evaluations, um, anything that we can help districts. And we're in about 30 different districts right now, uh, our clinicians. So that's also another wonderful uh, program. And then of course we have our summer program, our five week extended school year program that some families uh, join us for that. So. Um, so welcome today. I'm joined by two wonderful uh, educators and clinicians here at Cotting School. Uh, first, we have Lynn Condon, who is a board certified behavior analyst. We also have Laura Piscopo, who is a classroom teacher here at Cotting School for many years. Uh, welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks. Well, so we have a great uh, lineup in talking about uh, ABA and how that applies to the classroom. Let's just open up the conversation. Um, I think that we, we need to get a better understanding of what exactly ABA is. So um, Lynn, why don't you take us into that as far as what, what it actually means? So ABA is a, it's a learning theory in whole. It's not just, you know, a lot of people think about applied behavior analysis and they think that it's you know, discrete trial, or it's getting rid of bad behavior, and they just see this very small piece of what ABA is. ABA can be used in a variety of different ways, um, and in lots of settings with many different populations. You know, it can be used to help people lose weight. It can be used to help teach people new skills. It's not just about fixing a student or a problem. It's helping support students and people to achieve the best outcomes um, in one's, you know, it's specific in what it does often, but it's not just to fix something or get rid of something. It is to be supportive in multiple ways across different environments and people and populations. Yeah, that's great. I think it's important because we'll go through today and maybe uh, bust some myths about ABA, perhaps, because I think that some folks think about behavior, and when you say it's a behavior, it's it's like a negative connotation, right? But that's not necessarily the case. No. Yeah. Um, Talk every, about that a little I bit mean, more. everything we do is behavior. <laughs> um, you know, I, I joke sometimes that if you're not emitting behavior, then, well, we're probably attending your funeral. So, um, you know, everything we do is behavior, our speech, blinking, things that go on inside of our body, things that we do that people can observe. Any reaction to our environment is a response, is a behavior. And so to say that, you know, being a behavior kid is bad, it's, you know, I hate those qualitative terms for behavior because behavior is behavior and sometimes it's less adaptive. Sometimes it's not helping us access the things that we need or the outcomes that we want. So yeah, we come in and we find ways that will be better to access the things we need. So if a student is having challenging behavior, we understand, we find ways to look at that behavior and say, why are they doing this? What are they getting from doing this? What are they accessing? And what would be a more appropriate response? How, what can we teach them to help them access this thing without engaging in this you know, negative behavior, or maladaptive behavior? Um, and then there are other 
things that we talk about in ABA, you know, if there's a skill deficiency, just, you know, a student needs to learn how to do something and more traditional approaches may not be working. You know, is there a way to come in and support them more specifically through the environment um, and teaching those skills that they need? Yeah, so. That's a great synopsis. So tell us why behavioral health and those supports are so important um, at large, but really more importantly, why is it so important here at Cotting School? I think at Cotting in any school that specializes in special education or in any program, you know, even public schools and sub-separate programs, um, you know, there should always be kind of multimodal supports. And I think ABA has become increasingly a, a part of that. Um, it's, you know, that collaboration, not, you know, just my knowledge being brought to the table, but, you know, the communication therapists and the, mm. and, you know, the occupational therapists and the physical therapists and the teachers, you know, I'm primarily in a consultative role here. So, you know, part of what I need to do is, you know, get with the teachers, get with the people who knew and know these kids now and have known them. And, you know, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Where are the challenging times for them? And, you know, coming in and having those additional, sometimes environmental supports, you know, are, you know, what do they need to support them? We have a difficult time transitioning to new environments. You know, is there a way that we can come in and support them to make those transitions more successful? Um, you know, they have a difficult time staying in, in instruction for long periods of time. What sorts of supports can we add, you know, either changing the amount of time they're in instruction, reinforcement, offering more frequent, you know, instructional breaks, and to make them more successful um, and get to those best outcomes for them in their learning experience for them to access as much as we can offer them. That's great. So Mary, let's bring you into this uh, conversation here because what's your perspective as a classroom teacher, especially this year? I think for it's important for folks to understand that as a whole, Cotting hasn't really had behavioral supports uh, a person, a point person in place. So this year it's new, it's different. Yeah. How is that uh, lining up for you this year? Yeah, I think that it has been really incredible to have Lynn as a one of a kind member of this collaborative care model that we have. You know, she is able to work with teachers and other staff to share her knowledge of theories, of um, tools and resources. She helps us to make observations and understand how to take data, how to interpret data, and how to put all of these things into play in our classroom to help our students to become more independent and to help them be them be their best selves. That's really great. Yeah. And so can you both speak about, you know, how uh, we're using some of those behavior supports in the classroom? Could you want to start, Lola, about some specific things that yeah, we've done? Or? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, so really, as a teacher, and I think as many of prof the professionals here at Cotting, we are not experts in behavior. And we all want what's best for our students, but we don't always know what to do or how to do that. Um, and managing behaviors can be really challenging and it can be really stressful um, and it can feel overwhelming. Um, so Lynn has helped us with some really practical things like streamlining our language, mm. um, understanding how important the language we use with each other and also the language we use with our students is to help support their behavior and their success in the classroom. So an example of this um, that we've been using really successfully in our classroom um, is language we use around break times and letting students know when a specific break activity is available or if it's not available. Because sometimes, you know, you might be in the classroom and having a, mu a preferred music break is a great thing for a student to do as an incentive. But if we're out grocery shopping at Star Market, mm -hmm. 
that's not an appropriate break activity. We don't have the means to do that. Um, it's gonna disrupt a lot that's happening. So for us to be able to say, here are the breaks that are available, or if a student asks us for something and it's not really a great time to do that, we can say, you know what, that's not available right now. And that's a really helpful script that we can use. Um, and we don't really have to think too much into it. The student gets used to us using those language, that language. They get used to us sure. using it. They get used to therapists using it. They get used to other folks in the classroom using it. Um, and it really helps to support them. That's great. Yeah. That's really great. We talk about uh, terminology and how that's, you know, coming up and and um, we, we're trying to be consistent. So in our collaborative care model at Cotting, we're talking with therapists, teachers, um, any of, the, of our specialists that come in. And, you know, we've done some training this year, beginning with orientation right away, which was really yeah. fabulous. I had the chance to participate in that as well. Uh, we spoke a little bit, and I, I just this struck me uh, the term high probability task, Lynn, and it was something. It was a great way that it's a it's a good takeaway maybe for um, other educators and parents at home uh, could could really uh, use this in their practice. Talk a little bit about what that is. Sure, um, a high probability task is something that a student, a person can do very easily. It's a known skill. And even if you're feeling upset or angry or, you know, going through a challenging moment, this is something you know how to do. Um, so for some of our students, that looks different, um, you know, given, you know, the different abilities that we see at Cotting. And, you know, specifically in Lola's classroom, there was a student who it was answering yes, no questions. Um, so when he became dysregulated or upset, you know, we would see a lot of loud vocalizations and it was unclear, you know, what the function of the behavior was, you know, did he want attention? Did he want a break? And as we observed the behavior more, as I observed the behavior more, um, it became clear that this was something that he did for a lot of different reasons, not just for one specific reason. So we put together just a response and to ask him, is this your name? And he would give either a response using his device or a, you know, a low tech response, you know, looking right or left for yes and no. And after a few answering of those questions, we would you know, then ask him, hey, do you need space? Do you wanna to return to the group? Do you need to talk? Um, all yes, no questions. And then you know, as he would answer those, we were able to establish what he needed. You know, we were able to help him calm down and get him focused on a more adaptive behavior and more functional communication to let us know what he needed. Um, and, you know, this was a student who had, was missing a lot of instruction time sometimes because he was engaging in these lab vocalizations and it was disruptive um, to the classroom and it, this helped effectively to shorten those periods and get him back to where he needed to be um, and participating with his classmates and uh, with his just his day in general. So That's great. I love how simple it is. Yeah. It's just an easy strategy that it, it doesn't have to be about special education. It can no. be about educating you know, small children and I have a few of those at home. And if there is something that starts to go off the rails a little bit, it's a great way to recenter and refocus the conversation yeah. and try to get us back on track. Sure. And it's also a way, you know, so, you know, a high probability task or just a low effort task. So um, part of our training is with, you know, safety care. And we talk about helping, prompting, and waiting. So using that high probability task, it's, it's a good prompt. So if you you know, have a student who is, you know, refusing to move or having a hard time because, you know, they're, you know, upset about something, you can find something in the moment. What's something that, what's the first thing we need to do right now? Mm -hmm. You know, we're on the floor, we're refusing to move, our mask is off. Okay, like, why don't you put your mask on? And, you know, then we'll talk about what we need to do next. You know, I'm going to give you a few minutes. I'll check back in, um, you know, and there's that waiting. We are, we're going to step back and give you a few minutes and then go back in and see how we're doing. Are we ready to go back to the classroom or go to where we need to go next? So thinking about those high probability tasks, just, 
even just in that, it doesn't necessarily have to be something you're doing over and over again. It could just be, what's the next smallest step we need right now to get us moving back in the direction we need to go? That's great. Lynn, I've heard you refer to it as like driving the bus <laughs> or, you know, how are you going to turn, turn the car around? You're taking those small steps to sort of maneuver the student to where eventually you want them to be. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's really good. So let's, let's think about um, another area where behavior and those supports uh, can move forward, especially when we speak about transition. And I know that's a really important piece for you. So how is Cotting preparing as we go beyond you know, uh, Cotting School and into adulthood? What are you know, some of those strategies that we have in place? Well, I think that really the ideal situation is that we are able to identify the strategies and the systems that work best for each one of our students to increase their independence so that by the time they leave Cotting School, they are empowered to be their best selves. Um, you know, not just in a school environment, but in the community, at home, maybe on a community college campus, um, maybe at their job. It's not just about what's happening in the classroom. It's what about what is happening all around us and all around our students. Um, we want to pay attention, especially as students are getting older, on finding strategies and tools that are universal that aren't just tied to a specific place and a specific time to the classroom, to, um, you know, the student's mm -hmm. desk, the place they have, because the reality is they are going to be all over. So what are the types of tools that are going to support them that are going to be the most universal? You know, are you using a sand timer in a classroom? Is that realistic mm -hmm. in the community? Are we going to teach students how to use their iPhone timer instead as a more universal tool for them? Um, and then really, I think another really, really important part is to share all of this information with the folks that are going to be supporting the student once they leave. Um, the parents, the caregivers, the PCAs, um, folks from post-22 programs, um, we need to be able to share all of the information that we've learned and all of the strategies and tools so that can be carried forward and the students can continue to have success. That's great. Yeah, there's so many, so many areas that we, we have to think about, you know, in, in our, our range of students from, from three all the way to 22, we certainly uh, have a big scope, you know, that we're trying to addre address from the littles all the way to, to, you know, young adults and adults that are, you know, have a, a bright future ahead of them. And, and we're doing as much as we can to try to, you know, prepare them for that. Um, so let's 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 think about. I, I talked about myth busting a little bit, but you know, <laughs> I'm actually going to get into some myth busting in my <laughs> tenants case. So you know, segue. in some some perspectives and some experiences, ABA um, or BCBAs can be looked at as being a little bit rigid and not flexible and having to follow exactly the letter of the law, so to speak. Tell us a little bit about your experience with that, because I have, I have only experienced you as being very holistic and very open. So <laughs> Thank you. Tell us a little bit more. Um, you know, I come from a setting where we were collaborating with different professionals every day, you know, OTs, PTs, um, SLPs. So that's something that sort of growing up in the behaviorism world I've always had access to and always have had an appreciation for the knowledge that other professionals bring to the table. You know, I cannot do CBT. I'm not a counselor, you know, and clearly there are emotional needs and things like that that, you know, our kids and our students need. You know, so that's not my role. I'm, you know, I'm not going to step into that. If I come across a problem that I'm like, hey, you know, I can do these environmental supports for this. But we might want to work on some coping strategies and things in, a di in, in, in the counseling sessions. Um, and then I'll just interrupt for a second. CBT is what again? Um, so cognitive professional... behavior therapy, so Great. talk therapy. Great, talk therapy. Okay, love that. Um, you know, so that's, you know, that's not something I can do. You know, it's not my specialty. Do I know of coping skills? Can I 
Do I know ways to support and teach those coping skills? Yes, but I'm not necessarily going to be the professional that's going to be helping the student do that. Um, the same thing with you know communication therapy. You know, what is the best way for this student to communicate? That's not a determination I make. I can support the learning for those communication um, modalities and all of that and building the function between the word and what's happening in the environment. But I'm not going to be the person who's deciding, you know, what kind of the device or what modalities is happening. You know, there are other people who are more knowledgeable. Um, that I would refer to for that. Um, same thing with OT and PT. You know, I think you know, the some foundations of behavior analysis are, you know, some of those things that Lola talked about, you know, building independence, creating ways for students and people to access as much reinforcement, uh, you know, reinforcement being, you know, good things and enriching things in their lives as independently as they possibly can. You know, the, the less restrictive and the more independence we can, you know, make their environments here, the more successful they're going to be living independently um, once they leave here within you know, probably they're still going to continue to be supports and job coaches and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but if, you know, the more skills we can help them develop to successfully navigate those different situations, um, and the more we can help them generalize those skills from into environments outside of coding, I mean, that's the ultimate goal. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there is sort of this myth that I know I had in my mind <laughs> that a BCBA is going to come in and say, here's the plan. This is what you're going to do. Here's how you're going to do it. I'll check back with you a little later. Oh, things aren't going great. You need to do better with that. Um, and this is not what it's like to work with Lynn. She's collaborating with everybody on the team. And the team is working to create the systems and identify the tools that are going to help the student be independent. That's a process that is happening. We're all doing that together. Um, and that's, you know, that's the way we do things yeah. here at Cotting. That's the way we've <laughs> always done things. And you just very smoothly have yeah. come right in and really helped to support us to be better in that way. Yeah. Um, in a way that we really needed. Yeah, and I think that's important. You know, I think you're not wrong. BCBAs do do that. You know, but you know, through my career, I've learned that if the people who are implementing these strategies and the primary people who are using these things, you know, the direct care staff, if they're not able to implement them, if they're not bought in, if they're not sold on it, it's not going to happen and you're not going to see any kind of improvements in the areas that you need to see those improvements or changes um, or skills that need to be learned. So you need, as a BCBA, I, it's really my responsibility to work with the classroom while holding to you know the ethical standards and all the things that I need to and making sure I'm staying within the bounds of my competence. Um, but to apply the technologies of ABA and the methodologies of ABA in such a way that it makes sense for them mm. and it's going to be effective and they're going to be able to use it and implement it in a realistic way. You know, Codding has a group instruction model, which is, that's new to me. I come out of a one-to-one, -one, a one-to-two instruction model mm -hmm. program. So as a clinician, that's been a challenge for me. It's been something new. It's been a, a way to kind of stretch and spread my wings a little bit um, but it's also reinforced the fact that I need to rely on the people that know the students best and that is the classroom teachers and the program assistants and um, you know they're the ones with them the most throughout the day so what's going to work for them you know while still maintaining the integrity of the programming and and what I need to do yeah that's great and I think it's important for folks at home to know that you're working in more of a consultative model. Yes. So you're not actually in there, but you're really part of that collaborative care model that Lola was speaking about and all the things that you've talked about working with the therapists and, and clinicians is as we address the whole child. So I think that's that's really important. Um, as we look to, to close and kind of wrap up, is there anything else that you wanted to share with uh, everybody at home or that are watching and listening about last thoughts on ABA? I don't know, Lola. 
<laughs> and that's okay. That's yeah. right. All right. We, if there's any other uh, Q&A that has come in, we could certainly uh, address that uh, as well. Um, but, wow. uh, but if not, we, uh, we can certainly wrap. And uh, thank everyone for joining us today uh, here at Cotting School. And uh, you can certainly learn more about all of our programmings and the continuum of services uh, from all of our students and different programs at cotting.org. Um, thanks again for tuning in today. We look forward to seeing you and hosting you perhaps at an upcoming informational session. Uh, you can check our website for more details on that. But uh, thanks very much, everyone.